Uh, church, I want you to think about how, if asked, you would describe someone else, specifically how they look. This is a hard thing for me to do. Recently, Kristen asked me, we were trying to talk about somebody, we were kind of trying to piece together how these different people we know, and she said, well, what, is, what does she look like? And I said, <laughs> uh, normal, a normal height? Uh, what does her hair look like? Brownish, I think maybe, like maybe a little blonde or I don't know, dark brown. And uh, does she have glasses? I don't know. What color are her eyes? I don't. She had she had eyes. I know she had eyes. I would have noticed. I say ask this question because Luke, the gospel writer for these next weeks, is a master storyteller, and Luke never describe somebody accidentally. He never gives us details that are too small. In fact, sometimes it seems like he gives us these benign details, but they become the most rich facts that lead us to some really important truths. And then sometimes it will seem like Luke tells us things that make no sense. They they just don't go together. Why is that there? But if we follow those, they become these breadcrumbs to amazing meaning in the story. Luke never does anything by accident. And so, as we zoom in to the little town of Nazareth, and we get almost no detail about our main character this morning, I think we should ask why. We we arrive here in the city of Nazareth, in the region of Galilee, and Jews at this time had come to call Galilee, Galil Hagoyim, which means Galilee of the Gentiles. It has become so religiously, politically, culturally insignificant that the Jews have just basically given it away to the non-Jews. And Nazareth is a border town in Galilee. It is really, really not very important. But here we are, zooming in to Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee and we see our main character walking along the dusty red clay of northern Israel. And our master storyteller gives us almost no explanation. He describes our main character with very strange details. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from David, from God, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. We have learned almost nothing about her. We can infer, we can infer that she's no older than 18. And that is on the upper regions of her age. At the lowest, she's 12, probably 13 to 15. Let's go ahead and call her 14 years old. She is a young woman. And we learn that she is a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. We have learned more about her fiancé's family history than we have even learned about her. We don't even know her name yet. We just know she lives in a very insignificant place, in a very insignificant region, and she's not all that important. She's engaged to a man whose family used to be important. Luke says of our main character, six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and now we learn her name. The virgin's name was Mary. Well, six months after what? Not 20 verses earlier, our master storyteller tells another story about a man who we have tremendous details about. Here, before the temple of God, the most significant real estate, in the most significant town, stands a respectable man named Zechariah. And all of the people, everyone he's ever known, stands in a semicircle around him as he faces God's holy temple. And he is covered from head to toe with the adornments of the priesthood. And in his hand, 
he holds something that looks like a shepherd's hook with a wick coming out of the top, and that wick is lit. Zechariah is about to go into God's holy of holies, the most significant room in the most significant building, on the most, most significant real estate, in the most significant town in all of Israel, and all of Israel looks at him as he stands there on the most significant day of his life. Zechariah, who is of the order of the priests, has a uh, one has drawn the long straw. They, they would cast lots. They would draw straws for who got to go light the incense on behalf of the people. And it was Zachariah's turn. Once your straw was drawn, you could never again do this task. And so Zechariah is at the pinnacle of his career in the epicenter of importance. And all eyes are on him. He goes into the temple with the candle lighter lit. And he carries with him great excitement. But like most of us, he's always inside of his body holding excitement and pain. As Zechariah enters the temple, he carries with him the disappointment, the pain, the sorrow of not ever being able to have a child of his own. He and his wife Elizabeth are now quite old in age, and he's given up on that dream. And so he takes that pain with him too, along with the joy of the day and the candlelighter to go and pray on behalf of the people to light incense in the presence of God. And as he enters the Holy of Holies, the room that he becomes, walks into for the first and last time of his life, He goes over to the incense holder to pray for the people as they pray for him on the outside. And there, he falls down on his face in fear because there is someone else by the incense holder or something else. Zechariah goes to light the candle and he sees a strange being standing there where he expected God's presence to be. And the being says to Zechariah, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and was sent to you to announce these things to you. He said, Zechariah, you and your wife, Elizabeth, will have a son. And you will name him John. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your son will turn many of the children of Israel to their Lord, their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of the prophet Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah enters this room ready to encounter God's presence, and boy, was he surprised to see God's angel, Gabriel, standing there saying, that dream you've hoped for, it's going to happen. And not only will it happen, but your son will become for the people a messenger of God that will restore the people. And Zechariah asks a really reasonable question. How? For me and my wife are old. And the being, Gabriel, says, I have come from the presence of God to deliver you this message. And you ask, how? For this you will be punished. For this, for the entirety of your wife's pregnancy, you will be unable to speak. And this is one of those strange details that Luke gives us. Because six months later, away from the epicenter of importance and power, a little girl who means nothing, who you know almost nothing about and lives in a place that means nothing, asks the same question with very different results. Mary, walking along this dirt road, presumably by herself, encounters a strange being It says to her, Mary, don't be afraid. In fact, before that, angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he greets her by saying, 
Hello, O favored one. The Lord is with you. We expected the Lord to be in the Holy of Holies. He wasn't. We expected the Lord to be with Zechariah, an important person in the important places, in the important town, but he was not. To our great surprise, God is with a little girl on the very margins of society, and when God's messenger arrives in the world to be with humanity, the message is, hello, oh favored one, the Lord is with you. And don't be afraid, for behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and he uh, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary asks a completely obvious and reasonable question. How? I'm a virgin. And Gabriel doesn't punish her. Gabriel says, you will remain a virgin, but God is going to perform a miracle. You will become pregnant with God's own child. And behold, six months earlier, your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant in her old age because Mary, favored one, nothing is impossible when God is with us. So why does Mary get like the most inspirational explanation of all time and Zechariah gets his voice box ripped out? Temporarily. Some commentators will say, well, it's all in the tone, okay? Mary asks with hope and delight, and Zechariah asks in doubt and skepticism, but that's not in the text. I mean, Luke, master storyteller, has phrased their questions exactly the same. They have the same words in them, except for, rather than, for I am an old age, it is for I am a virgin. Some commentators will say, well, I mean, Zachariah should have known better. He's in of the priesthood, and he's going in to light incense for God. He's prayed for this for a long time. Mary's just bewildered, and she's a little girl who just doesn't know better, and she wasn't expecting to encounter God. But again, that's all inference, and I want to give both Luke and Zachariah and Mary more credit than that. What if instead of asking what's different about two identical responses. We're asking the wrong question. What if we start saying what's similar? And what's Luke doing here that's trying to grab our attention? Well, there's a lot that's similar, but I want to focus on what happens inside of the bodies of both Zechariah and Mary. Zechariah can't talk for nine months. This Thing he expected to be able to do, like you and I woke up this morning, he being expected to be able to do the things we've been able to do our whole lives is taken from him. I bet when he walked out, people talked and said, what happened inside there? He must have made God angry. He may have done something he shouldn't, shouldn't have done. He's probably had some shame brought on him. But Zechariah is given this strange blessing of not being able to explain and not being able to describe what happened in there. He just has to sit with the message of the messenger of God as that message grows inside of him. And he looks forward to the coming of God's message in the world, which is so much like what happened to Mary. She becomes pregnant, and in an honor-shame society, when a young girl becomes pregnant before she is married, don't you just know people talked about her? Don't you know the names they called her? Don't you know the shame that she felt as her belly grew, as the word of God inside of her grew? But Mary had a secret, just like Zechariah. 
that the very people who are gossiping about her will be saved by the scandal inside of her as it grows and proceeds to become reality to the world, the hope of the world. Because even when the message of God's coming with us is spoken, it ruins everything. It changes everything. It gives life to everything. Don't you just know when Zechariah's son, John, is born and he gets to say to the people, the boy's name is John, and he gets his voice back. Don't you just know that he looks back on that time of silence, of pregnant waiting and expecting for God's words to actually come true. Don't you just know he looks back on that time of, ble- of curse as a gift, as his life's greatest blessing? As he sat there waiting in anticipation, God changed him. And it was shameful. And people whispered. And he would never give that time back because in that time of pregnant waiting, God showed him what God will do when he comes to be with us. And Mary, Mary had to endure something far, far worse. She was already so insignificant on the margins of society. Could her life become less significant? Yes, it could. She, become, she could become pregnant before marriage. And as the people whisper, the hope of waiting for God's truth to become reality grows inside of her, and she knows the secret. She knows the secret miracle of God's with. This is not a scandal. This is a miracle. And it made everything worse before everything was saved. And that is just how God's arrival tends to work. I ask to understand what God is doing all the time. I ask for God to show us what he is doing in this church that we might follow them. And then when people complain, not necessarily you, but when people whisper or something is hard or we get pushback, I think, well, we must be doing something wrong. People don't like this. Things got harder before they got better. And what I often fail to realize is that when God comes to a broken world, we are often scandalized by the miracle. Before we realize it's saving us. And I am just often too weak and afraid and anxious about the whispering to sit in pregnant waiting of God's arrival. And so, can I look at the discomfort as joy? Can we see the whispering and the complexities and the increasing difficulties of lives as proof that God is coming to change a world that doesn't know him and that what grows inside of us is a secret miracle of God's with and that because I hold this miracle in my body and it changes everything I can look forward to the moment when it will save everything around me. I can be with difficult people because I know that God is growing inside of me. I can endure complexities and difficulties of life because with God, nothing is impossible. With God, I can do anything. And here, as we sit as we wait for Jesus' arrival on Stan Sunday. We want something. We want something good, but we want something impossible. I'm learning that a lot of these things that we want, that we long for, change everything, and that we have to be prepared for that. I'm learning a lot of new things about our new city. I'm learning about Stan Sunday and all that it's about. I'm learning that I love a lot of things about San Antonio. I love breakfast tacos. Um, I love our neighborhood and our schools. I love the friends that we're making. I love the Spurs. Um, Yes, the basketball team of my childhood was ripped ruthlessly away from me, and so now I am a free agent, and I have chosen the Spurs. 
I love Victor Wimbanyama and Devin Vassell. I love the people of this church and the hope that we continue to remind each other of. There are some things that I have learned about this city that I do not love. Our city has some of the largest income disparity of any large city in America. And with that comes a foster and adoption care crisis. As of last summer, our immediate area has 3,318 children in the foster care system. That's too many. That is one of the largest ratios of any large city in America. 39% of siblings in the foster care system are separated from each other. 47% of children who leave foster care return within five years. 76% of all sex trafficking victims come from the foster care system. 45% of the homeless population has spent some time in foster care. 40% of children who age out of the foster system will be incarcerated at some point in their lives. Not county jail, incarcerated. You may have known this, but in Texas, any child who spends any significant amount of time in the foster care system can go and get free college and state tuition. What an amazing deal. Less than 3% ever take advantage of it because so few ever graduate high school. This is a problem that feels impossible. How do we ever start to make a dent in any of this? But I'm hoping that the Zacharias and the Marys of Northside can remind me when I feel like it's too hard to get involved in foster care. I hope that the Zacharias and the Marys of Northside can say to me, remind me, oh, favored one, God is with you. And if God is with you, nothing is impossible. Can we be troubled by the foster care crisis in our city? Can we take some small steps? Maybe fostering isn't right for you. Maybe adopting isn't right for you right now, but there are so many ways to help. From CASA to respite, so many things I'm learning about. We can do something. Can we be troubled by the foster care crisis around us? Can we take some small steps to enter the mess of what is, by all accounts, an impossible situation? It might cause our lives to become more complicated, to become greatly uncomfortable, but that is okay because God is with us. Since God is with us and the words of God grow within the bodies of us who have heard of the message of Jesus' coming. Because that eager expectation pregnantly grows within our bodies as we look and wait for his second coming. Can we, who have heard God call us favored ones, can we say back to God, let it Be unto me according to your will, because you are with me. And when you are with me, nothing is impossible. As the worship team comes forward, church, receive this blessing. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you wherever he may send you. May he lead you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors. Amen.